capitalism versus, versus communi communism. We this seem to be way past way beyond that. that. Yeah. You know, we have tried so many recipes in the past years all over the place, in the north, in the south, mm. and they don't work. Mm. So you start suspecting that you have to, you know, dig out even deeper. And then you are faced with the problem of this whole civilizational model that we have been following, that has really, ha has really come into crisis and has, is really suffering a breakdown. I think that's what it amounts to. That's where we are, we are at, at the moment. Hello, I'm Hazel Henderson. Welcome to Worth Quoting, a program sponsored by Florida Community College at Jacksonville. Today, we're going to talk about new paths to development. And I have two guests who are both dear friends of mine. And I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you will enjoy it. My first guest is Ambassador Frank Gracho. Uh, who has been former ambassador. former ambassador, he tells yes. me, who has been uh, just returned from being Venezuela's ambassador to India. And he is an author of uh, uh, more than two books, but two at least. And uh, this one, uh, Redefining Wealth and Progress, uh, which was part of a conference that um, I helped him with uh, in Caracas. And his uh, newer book called toward a new human development paradigm. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. And my next guest is Dr. Keshiva Bhatt, who is a professor of botany and who was born in India, but for the last 26 years has lived in Venezuela. Welcome, Dr. Bhatt. Hello, how are you? Well, I'm fine. And we are going to pick up one of our favorite conversations, and that is, to uh, discuss a little bit why the old-style development from the past has failed, uh, where it bogged us down in pollution and waste and uh, new sicknesses and all kinds of social uh, costs that we are now having to deal with. And many prophets have uh, been in many countries uh, predicting that the old kind of development wasn't going to work. Uh, wasn't going to be sustainable. That's the new fashionable word, isn't it? And I think that we are all beginning to realize that what worked in Europe in the early Industrial Revolution and then came to North America um, and was very successful there uh, cannot work all over the world because uh, all cultures are different. And so you cannot replicate the same formula like industrial cookie cutter uh, formula for development in every country. And it seems to me in my travels, as I know both of you have traveled around in many countries, that each country seems to have its own what I call cultural DNA code. And it's really that culture and the value system of that culture uh, which shapes different paths to development. And the economists uh, can't have one model that's going to fit everywhere in the world. So both of you, in your own ways, predicted all of this um, decades ago. So I would like to start by uh, asking you both, let's begin with Frank, uh, where do you see the development process going at this moment? You know, we were all three of us at Rio in 1992 at the Earth Summit. And let's just begin by seeing where you think uh, things are going now. Well, I, I think, as you have pointed out, uh, it is apparent worldwide today that we have uh, plenty of warning signs, signals, and plenty of evidence that points to the fact that uh, we are encountering you know, this very serious shortcomings with the way development has been conceived. Uh, you know, you were talking about things that work in Europe, in, in, in America. I, I would add, if they ever work, the way people said they worked. 
Uh, they are not working in America and in Europe anymore, obviously, and they don't work in the South either uh, because of what you mentioned, uh, uh, the cultural DNA aspects of development, the distinctiveness of national societies, the distinctiveness of national settings. Now uh, environmental concerns have revalued more than ever the importance of, of develop, development being nationally sensitive locally sensitive, so you can have a better management of natural resources. But this is just in addition to many more factors that have been piling up. Uh, you know, income inequities, lack of participation of whole populations, uh, the worsening of poverty. Uh, this is really connected in the end to a number of aspects of a whole civilizational model, uh, more than a problem of you know the market versus the the the, the state mm. capitalism versus versus communi communism we this seem to be goes way, past way beyond that, that. Yes. you know we yeah. have tried so many recipes in the past years all over the place in the north and the south mm. and they don't work mm. so you start suspecting that you have to you know dig out even deeper and then you are faced with the problem of this whole civilizational model that we have been following that has really ha have really come into crisis and has, is really suffering a breakdown. I think that's what it amounts to. That's where we are, we are at, at the moment. So where do you see the new directions? Um, well, How do you see the problem? I would see the problem this way. Each cultural DNA, as you suggested, is locally developed, whereas we are putting in that panorama another economy as a standard model we developed somewhere else. Then we pushed through items to some other new places where it is not fitting at all. Even at the same place it is not fitting now. Because, as I understand it, the time has changed. The dynamism of nature, dynamism of the civilization is at work. Whereas we are taking the old model and we are presenting it. That is where we are failing. And that too, without considering the local necessities, local habitats, and that's where mm -hmm. the problem lies, as far as we have seen. And did you first discover this in India? Well, as uh, I can recollect now, there was a difference in my formation, I would say. As a student, in the early days, I never had an opportunity to see the Western civilization as such. So my world was just what I knew in India, the village life or the city life. When I first came to the Western civilization, I was exposed to the Western civilization, then I could see the difference. It was a big impact. And once I saw the difference, then I had to reflect myself. Where is the problem? Then I could face the problem and get a solution for that. And so that really shaped your life and That's, your work. In fact, yeah. uh, the former formative stage, I can say, it was just collecting information. Once mm. I saw the Western civilization in person, then I could compare both and take out the good things from both and leave out the bad things from both. That's mm -hmm. what we are doing for the past several years. And I should point out that you have also written many books and these are two books on this subject. Yes. The Basics of Natural Health. So you went really back to the basics and this one with the beautiful cover, The Holistic Life. Yes. Yes. So in these two books, uh, my ideas are crystallized there. Yeah. In fact, for the first time, I'm suggesting some new ideas in those books. Great. Well, that's terrific. So really, uh, I think that uh, w where we need to, to go from here is to look at what was that formula uh, that grew out of Europe? and grew out of the Industrial Revolution. And that's what's interested me uh, all of my adult life, 
How did it go so wrong? How did that little strand of cultural DNA that was working in the industrial society, uh, which, uh, the way I saw it, it was all about labor-saving devices and more and more efficient machines and mass production, and that this would lead us to all of the goods and services we would ever need, and we would have leisure. And, of course, we see now that it was very naive, don't we? And I remember when uh, the three of us were in Rio, uh, we all three attended a meeting about what was wrong with economics and what was wrong with the old formula uh, for economic growth as measured by a growing gross national product. And uh, so I think that um, I'd like to, to get both of your comments on um, how would we um, rewrite the formula uh, so it wouldn't be quite so simplistic, just more and more money income and more and more production. Um, but it, it um, met other goals. So, you know, I know this has been a great uh, interest of, of Frank's. I mean, what do yeah. you think are all these other goals that we should have in those scorecards of yeah. progress? Well, you see, I think uh, the bottom end with the environmental question is the kind of development path that you have chosen. And to me, that was a major missing item in Rio. In the end, I mean, of course, Rio did a lot of things in terms of conscientizing the world, uh, in terms of the extent of environmental problems, in terms, in terms of getting to Rio, a lot of heads of states, policymakers, world public opinion, tackling, you know, some environmental issues as such, although superficially in many respects. But they didn't really get to the bottom end of the question, which is the model of economic development that we have followed, you know, from which the environmental problems have stemmed. Uh, and this amounts to, in the end, to the patterns of consumption and production. You see mm -hmm. why environmentalists were protecting birds and animals. You know, they were nice mm -hmm. guys, you know. They even <laughs> got generous finance from governments and cor private corporations. <laughs> then they started to talk about the relevance, the relevance of poverty and injustice, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of environmental problems, poverty being the main depredating force. On, on the environment. Mm. Then they started to become a nuisance when they took this up. And then in the end, some of them have taken up the issue of the change in the patterns of consumption and production of the bottom line. Then mm. they have mm. become openly subversive <laughs> and nasty guys to listen to. Yes. And, and this is, was the, you know, the, uh, to me was the decisive issue in Rio. It was not really tackled. It was not really tackled by governments. Even NGOs came short of tackling this yes. issue. And uh, I think uh, the basic thing to pursue this kind of sustainable development that everyone is talking about today is to identify these scorecards you are talking about, to identify new indicators of development. If, uh, if we don't do that, you know, mm. efforts may continue to go astray, you know, they yeah. may continue to, to get lost. And then mm. citizens themselves will not have a way to monitor their government's actions mm -hmm. to yes. demand from their government's compliance with these uh, new yardsticks that we, we need. Yeah. And we have to elevate mm -hmm. these new yardsticks to the same category of importance and respect that the gross national product yeah. uh, yardstick has had so far. Well, it's like uh, Dr. Bart was saying uh, earlier today, that um, we have to clarify th these values. And uh, to me, it seemed to be that we confuse the means, which was called economic growth, with the ends, and the ends Very is much so. human development. That's correct. And so why don't you tell us where you think this should go? I think at Rio de Janeiro, one thing was very clear. All were talking about sustainable development, sustainable agriculture, ecology, protection of endangered species, and all these things, biodiversity, all these topics we discussed there. But many of the topics discussed, as far as I could see, they were all theoretical discussions. But when it came to, came to practical means, very few could follow up that theoretical concepts. That shows mm -hmm. a difference between theory and practice. Mm -hmm. The ecologists 
who was theoretically perfectly all right, when it came to practical grounds, he failed to totally. And so they weren't walking the talk. Well, right. that's, that's the idea. <laughs> See, within the conference hall, everything was all right. When the person came out of the conference hall, he would show out his modern civilization. And light up a cigarette. That's it. <laughs> you know, drinks, you know, chemicals of <laughs> Drink you know, drinks. <laughs> I mean, you know, ecologists themselves yes. have to revise Lot their own attitudes, work. you know. Yes. That's Too many ecological activists have to revise their own attitudes to see to yes. what extent their own personal practice is being coherent with what they are preaching in terms of the greening of the world. Yeah. I mean, how can yes. we pursue the greening of the world if we don't pursue the greening of our own bodies? Yes, exactly. The decontamination of our own bodies. Yes. Yes. In our own minds. You know, <laughs> yes. How far you can get. <laughs> Perhaps we, we should have started this way. We normally represent heart with the red color. We should have started with the green color. Ah, a green heart. A green heart. Yes. <laughs> now you are, you are, have done a lot of work on the whole basis of economic development being agriculture, and the uh, I mean not necessarily agriculture but the natural plant world. And is it, that where we have to start? No, we would. I would go one step <laughs> earlier still. Okay. We would go further and say the basic elements of the nature, like air, sunlight, water, soil, flora and fauna. We have to start right from there. Whereas economics just treats only once you harvest it, once it is transformed into money. Whereas we have to go right to the basics, that's the basic elements of the nature and mm -hmm. how they are getting spoiled by exploitation. We should have utilized the sources for human benefit. But what we are doing is, we are exploiting it for growing the monetary benefits. Yes. That's quite different. And see, the point that I always make uh, in, in my books is that if we made the manufacturers pay all the full cost of using those resources, including the cost of cleaning up the pollution or preventing it, and the cost of using the clean water and all of this, then the prices of the products would be full cost price products. And then that would at least get the economic scorecard straight in terms of a whole lot of products that are really junk or wasteful or that people don't really need uh, would disappear from the market. There is one simple problem. We can perhaps measure the damage done to the nature, but it cannot be converted into economic levels. We cannot say how much damage we have uh, done to the nature in mm. terms of millions of dollars. Yes. We can only do the cleaning work how much it costs, yes. but the damage done we can never recover. Yes, that's, I mean... That's where we have to start. Yes, and, and the trouble is with economics is that they use a formula how much would the consumer be willing to pay to repair the damage? That's it. Whereas really, you know, that uh, is still a recipe for making a terrible mess of everything. More of the same, yes. in a way. Yes, so, so what, what we have to do really is to get to the prevention yes. point That's about it. That's the starting it. point. Yes. Now, um, another very important issue that grows out of this basis um, is how do we get back to a really clean and diverse food supply so that we're not monoculturing just one or two crops so that if the, if the corn or the wheat or the soybeans fail, um, you have uh, starvation or there's far too much of that stuff is produced and not enough of these diverse crops that nature has provided us with. The problem is just this. Once economy gets into that, to become more economical, to use all the modern instruments, agro-industry to grow, you have to mechanize the farm. At that mm -hmm. stage, you have to grow in large extensions, otherwise it is not economical. So if you want to go back to that real protection of nature, you have to reduce the farm machinery, first of all, because mm -hmm. more and more people work straight in the field, 
then the production will increase, of course, because a small farmer knows how to take care of his land. And small farmers in this country lose their farms every year to the bigger and bigger combines, mostly because of the faulty economics, economics. that doesn't show what is really efficient. If they really had to pay for all the ecological damage and the oil and the pesticides and all of those inputs, the small farms actually could compete. Truly. And agricultural, I mean, the chemical agriculture would be a very expensive business. Actually, yes. it's very expensive when you consider all these so-called, how, 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 do, how do economists uh, call them? Ex external call diseconomies. Ex external somebody else, let, let somebody else take care of it, you know? <laughs> but in the end, the entire society has to yeah. take care of it. Uh, mm. But uh, I think, uh, as Dr. Bat suggests, the scale of production is one thing that has to be tackled. I mean, you have to come down from this big bigness approach, you know, to have everything yes. big, you know, big, Trickle down. big units of production, Economics. you know, big yeah. machinery. Yeah. And, you know, go the way of nature, you know. I mean, the way of nature is, you know, you know, grow a diversified base mm -hmm. of crops, no? Yeah. They interact, they help each other, you know. Yes, this well, is, this is the, and then to do that, uh, basically, I mean, I mean, uh, normally it implies to go into a, you know, a much smaller scale of production. And you know, there was yeah. um, a National Academy of Sciences report here in the U.S. about four years ago actually acknowledging that if all right. of these factors were taken into account, that small organic farming uh, would be the more efficient way to go, even in this country. But of course, um, it's growing very slowly, this smaller organic uh, production. It is the way of the future. You already have, I understand here in America, a market of about 10 billion US dollars of organic produce. Really? So it's, it's, it's growing fast. But the, you see, the question of the scale of production, I mean, in terms of the new paradigm, is also linked to uh, very much a need of the hour nowadays, namely political decentralizing and the necessity to, you know, foster democracy worldwide through democracy, participatory, participatory mm -hmm. democracy. Yes. I mean, how can you have local democracy, participatory democracy, decentralized politics, if you don't have local bases? Of and the local of, of farmers. I mean, you, you know, see this. Things you can rely on locally. You yes, don't have to depend yeah. on, you know, if you are here in Jacksonville, you don't have to depend on your New York City guys to get, you know, your supplies of local agricultural produce, you know, because oh, yeah, you should grow it right. here. You, 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 yeah. So you can provide local employment, so you can have your own, sure. you know, basis of sustenance. Yeah. And then you can have your own political power as well. You know, you are not yes. dependent on somebody else. Because you can see this, <laughs> this model works in China, in the rural areas in China. Uh, when Deng Xiaoping came in in 1978, the whole thing was to make the farmers rich. And once the farmers are rich um, and the villages are rich, uh, then you start um, moving out from there. You remember the phrase at uh, Rio, that ecological debt, pollution debt. Ah, yes. You remember that? I do. Yes. Oh, yes. Remind me of that. Yes. But so, once the raw materials are drawn from the nature, used for manufactured goods, it is converted into money. Whereas, the raw products, when they are removed from the source, lot of elements are becoming extinct. Yes. yes. And also, yes. the destruction of the nature is, starts there. Yes. So, precisely that was the point discussed at Rio, the ecological debt that developed nations have in front of developing nations. Yes, I mean, I estimated that pollution debt that the North owes the South at about $16 trillion, much, much more than all of the debts that the Southern Hemisphere countries owe to the North. And we return there off. again, uh, now the, the other issue, since we're running out of time, is that do you think it's going to be possible for some of these socially responsible smaller companies, not the multinationals, uh, to go into the rainforest and to help the local people so they can stay in the rural areas and take care of the, the plants and, and still make a, a, a livelihood with these small companies in the north? Well, it is possible. Main reason is just this. About 80% of the humanity lives in the tropics. Also, about 80% of the natural resources you get in the tropics. That Actually, means the tropics should be called the first world, not the third world. Yes, in terms the of real, the abundance of resources, the resources, resources. <laughs> Because the knowledge about the usage of those resources, 100% mm -hmm. you get there. 
So, that is quite evident that if we want to develop small group as you suggest, this is the only alternative. Mm -hmm. There is yes. no way out. Yes, and uh, the trouble is at the moment with these economies of scale that the economists tell us about, which are really wrong, we get these enormous companies and they will go into these countries in the south and buy up their cropland and produce sugar to put into soft drinks. And that to refine and sugar. Whatever corporations and companies do, even well-meaning companies, you know, companies of the new era, and I think we need a lot of that and we should look forward to good things coming from these mindful companies. You know, but whatever they do, I think it still has to be checked by you know, well-informed citizens and non-governmental organizations. Yeah. Because the power of money is one thing, you know, money-driven interest, and yes. the power of public interest is another thing. And I think the two need each other, you know, yes. for right things to happen. Then you have a third major actor, which is governments. You know, governments have their role to play. You know, we cannot do without governments either. You know, all this free market, you know, laissez-faire, you know, credo and gospel that has been sweeping the world, you know, Mm. has given the impression to too many people that states, you know, and governments, you know, were oh. out of the game, you know. Yes, and it's not we, either We do or. need public yes. policy, you know, enlightened sure. public policy, efficient public policies, you know, because yes, we are I still mean, facing problems that, you know, need, the, you know, this kind of government uh, role. Yes, and I think and even and the, uh, we realize we need regulation. I mean, yes. you can't imagine driving across Jacksonville, Florida without traffic lights. Yes. I mean, there has to be some kind well, of even in the case of a place like Mexico City, you know, yes, a, a, a government as self-professed in free market as the government of Mr. Salina has had to, you know, decree a 30% cut in, in, the, in the activities of polluting industries within Mexico City. Yeah. It has had to decree, you know, restrictions to public transportation within the city because of yeah. pollution, you know. And so I think regulation yeah. is needed. You, you yes. cannot do without it, you know, in terms of these needs. Well, I think, you know, we're going to have to wrap up. I wish we could talk for the rest of the afternoon about this. But we are beginning to see some of the pathways forward. Uh, I hope, and uh, I want to thank you both very much for being thank with you. me. Thank you. And uh, until next time, uh, this is Hazel Henderson from Florida Community College at Jacksonville. Thank you.